Mark chapter 6. And I'll begin reading in the seventh verse, but ask that you stand in honor of the reading of his word. In talking to the twelve, he began to send them forth by two and two. He gave them power over unclean spirits. And he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place ever you enter into a house, there abide till you depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you. When you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they came, then they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick. And he healed them. Father, in Jesus' name, your word, your spirit, your heart to us, your desire for us, ultimately your glory. And so I pray that you would illumine our minds, that you would challenge us right where we are. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name. I want you to think about the implications of this story. A young man applied for and was hired to stock shelves in a local grocery store. He was to report on Monday. When Monday arrived, the man was not there. He was not there Tuesday, nor Wednesday, or Thursday. However, on Friday, the man appeared at the clerk's window demanding the pay in the loan. The clerk responded in disbelief, saying, But you haven't done anything for which to be paid. To which the man replied, I was hired, wasn't I? Now this would be laughable if not for the saintly similarities. See, one day many believers will stand before the pay window of heaven and demand to be rewarded only to have God ask you haven't done anything. I wonder how many believers will respond. Well, I was saved. Wasn't I? See, if you remotely resemble the scenario that it's time to confess and it's time to repent of the sins of indifference and inactivity and go beyond, hear me, go beyond your redemption and assume your responsibility. Now let's look at the story before us. It begins with the commission of the disciples given by the Lord. And he called unto him, the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two. Some, and you know this to be true, are not willing to face the reality that there is something more than being saved than being saved. That there is something more to Christianity than being converted. That there is something more to the new birth than just being born again. That there is an expectation that comes with the experience. Jesus called and he commissioned the twelve. No, by the way, by extension, everyone who has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So if you're saved, amen, if you are saved, the Savior has selected you for service. And to ignore the Savior's summons to service while sitting in your seats 
of security is a travesty against the trust that God has placed in you. Redemption does not assume responsibility. It assigns responsibility. So quit being like Jonah who said, I'm not going to do it. Spending your Christian life making excuses for why you can't be dependent on to do anything. Quit being like a early day Moses who said, let someone else do it. Crippling the work of the ministry. Quit being like Gideon hiding behind the barn who said, I would if I could, but I can't. So why try living in defeat? And start being like a Caleb who said, let me do it. And became victorious over the giants in the land. Oh, let us cry out this morning, let me do it. And become victorious over the giants in our lives. Quit turning a deaf ear to the Lord and hear the call of God. I know two things very quickly about this call. It was first a call to what? Come unto him. I won't be able to unpack this very much this morning, but what I'm about to say is vitally important. Discipleship can only occur through intimate connection with the Master. The level of our intimacy will determine the measure of our success for the Savior. And that's why He called the twelve to come unto Him before He ever sent them out. Discipleship always precedes service. I mean, mean spirited when I say what I'm about to say, but hear me. We don't need more people serving. We need more people serving who have been in the presence of the Lord. So it is first and foremost a call to come unto Him. But secondly, after the connection, there was a commission. It was a call to go forth. He began to send them forth. Jesus, knowing the time of his ministry on earth would be short, and that there was much work to be done, he sent the disciples out as his ambassadors into the world. They were to go into the cities, the villages, and everywhere people gathered, preparing the hearts of man for the coming of the Lord. And as it was, it is today. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote in chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, hear me, the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are. Of Jesus Christ. We are proclaimed with our lips and we are persuaded by our lives that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. And, and that's why we're here on earth, my friends, and not already with Him in heaven. By the way, success is not measured in our results. Did you hear that? Success is not measured in our results. Success is measured by our obedience. Amen. Leaving the results in His hands. So let us heed the call and let us herald <coughs> His coming. However, to carry out the commission of Christ requires a little bit more. As a disciple, we must have confidence in our sender. The confidence of the disciples. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. So to carry out the commission of Christ requires confidence first in God's power available to you. 
Verse 6 says that he gave them power over unclean spirits. So it's no wonder that when the disciples returned from their missionary journey that they reported, even the demons are subject to us through your name. And they could do what they did because of their confidence in God's power, not their own. Now listen to me. I just pick a few low-hanging fruit this morning. If you're afraid of failure, then know that God's power is always available to God's people to accomplish God's purpose. Amen. Philippians 4.13 I can do most everything. <laughs> no. I can do all things through Christ who enables, who strengthens me. But not only confidence in God's power, to carry out the commission of Christ requires confidence in God's provision that is available to us. And he commanded that they should take nothing for their journey. Don't take a staff, or you can take a staff. He had that to, 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 to walk with in the journey. No script, a beggar's bag, no bread, no money in their purse, but to be shot with sandals necessary again for the journey and not put on two coats. The Lord wanted them to complete, be completely dependent upon who? On him. He wanted them to be completely dependent upon God for their every need. He wanted them to realize God would take care of them in the work of the ministry. When you take to the bank this morning, if you have a need, a need resulting from your faithfulness to God, then God will always be faithful to you in meeting that need, whatever it is. Amen. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And don't get me wrong. When you think of this story, faithfulness to Christ's call is an always result in decisions for and dedication to Christ. Because you're sitting out there thinking, well, if I do everything the Lord wants to do, everybody's just going to respond to the message that I preach, and they're going to be obedient to God's fault. No, that's not the case. It wasn't the case, and it's not the case. The choice of the disbelieving. And he said unto them, what place soever you enter into a house, there abide to you depart from that. And whosoever shall not receive you, how dare them? The disciples were going out two by two, preaching the gospel. How dare they not say, yes, yes, Lord. But you understand, more people say no than ever say yes. I mean, do you think you represent the majority of the people in Jonesboro this morning? No. He said, but whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart, then shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily, verily, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for salt and more in the day of judgment than for that city. Here again. They were not rejecting the disciples. And that's good to understand. They were rejecting a message from heaven, an invitation of God. And as a result, they were like Sodom and Gomorrah, falling under the judgment of the Lord. Only worse. You say, how can it be any worse? The people of Sodom and Gomorrah were killed by fire. In the story. The people who rejected the message of Jesus delivered by the disciples would perish forever in the fires of hell. And that's why it's worse. And one last thing. Christ sent them forth with a message and a ministry. The communicate the conflict and compassion disciples. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed. Now before I talk about the what, once again we need to consider the where. They went where? Out. Thank you, brother. They went out. See, somewhere along the line, we, we've gotten our mind messed up. And we've made ministry about coming where? In. Ministry is not about coming in. Yes, we learn here. Yes, we edify. Yes, we encourage. Yes, we live Yes, we pray. Yes, we fellowship. But ministry is not about coming in. And for those of you that are 
sitting here this morning and said, well, I, I, I've been a part of ministry. I came to church today. Wrong. Ministry is not about coming in. Ministry is about going out. Amen. And until we start going out, we will not be the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until we start going out, we're not going to make a difference in the world in which we live. A young man was hired as a lifeguard on one of the beaches in California. But instead of going down to the beach, he sat in the clubhouse, impervious to the swimmers. How do you feel about what he did? And the truth of the matter is he did exactly what most believers do today. Instead of going out where we belong, instead of going out where we should be, we are what? Coming in. Impervious to the lost in the world that are dying daily without a Savior, going off into eternity to a place called hell where they will remain forever and ever and ever. And here we sit. Let me meddle just for a minute. Because I'm good at that. I'm not much of a preacher, Keith, but I'm a good meddler. Assuming you have a story, and if you're saved, you got one. When was the last time you shared your story with someone? <coughs> Don't pause, because I want you to sit there and think about it. When was the time? I didn't say when was the last time you invited someone to church. That's a good thing. But you won't find that in Scripture. When was the last time you shared your story with someone? I try every week to make it a point in my personal journey to share my story with someone who doesn't know my Savior. That's a call. Now we understand the where. Now we can look at the what. He sent them out with a threefold task, which they accomplished. Number one, he sent them out with a message of change. I just use the word change because it's a lot more powerful than the word repent. And he preached that men should repent. Now here's the significance in that. Before you can preach the good news, you need to explain the bad news. And the bad news is that man, and I love this part, is a miserable, wretched, worthless, dirty, vile, filthy, stinking, low-life sinner bound for hell. With no apologies. See, once you get a man lost, that's the bad news. You get to follow that with what? The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And what you need to do is admit you are a sinner. Admit your need for a Savior. Turn from your sin while trusting Jesus Christ by faith. And you will become part and part of God's eternal family. So he sent them out with a message of change. Here's what you are. Here's what you can be. See, if all we ever said, and by the way, we make this mistake sometimes, we love to point out people's sin. If all we ever talk to them about is what they are, we fail the gospel. We tell them what they are, but then we tell them what they can be in Jesus Christ. Secondly, he sent them out on a ministry of conflict. You know, this and they cast out demons. See, you never do the work of the Lord without confrontation from Satan. He will oppose believers on every avenue. Remember of him. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly, but the enemy came as a thief to steal, kill, and destroy. He's like a roaring lion going throughout the world seeking whom he may devour. His job is to stop you from sharing your story.
glory so that a sinner might be saved. He will do everything that he can to keep Christians and the church from being on mission for the Lord. Here's the good news. Greater he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Here's the good news. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Here's the good news. At the name of Jesus, the devil flees. Yes, when you're serving the Lord, there's going to be conflict. Oh, by the way, this is one of those things you can just kind of stick back and just remember. When a church begins to experience revival, when a church begins to see God move, you had better understand Satan is going to be sitting in the congregation somewhere. And he's going to seek to do all that he can to disrupt, diminish, destroy. That's great. So he sent them out with a message of change. This is what you are, but this is what you can be. He sent them out into a ministry of conflict. Satan seeking to destroy. And then he sent them out on a ministry of compassion. I don't know how many times I've read this story. I don't know how many times I've missed this. Just missed it. And it's wonderful. Because here's what it says. And anointed with all many that were sick. Well, wait a minute. They're the disciples of the Lord. They had the power of God. All they had to do is walk into the city and say, be healed. You see where we're going? No, I'm in there. All that education and you still doesn't get it. Notice the hands-on ministry. They sought those who had physical needs, who were hurting, and they ministered to those needs. See, guys, it's not, I mean, it's all spiritual, but it's not all spiritual. I mean, if the story had just ended, they went and preached repentance, and they confronted de demons, and they were victorious, we'd say, Amen! What a story! But it didn't stop there. They saw the needs that were, that were around them, and they took the time to minister to the physical hurts. They took the time to minister to the, the emotional pain and to deal with the baggage that was there. They took the time... Maybe to drop in a few coins in the beggar's cups because they were hungry. And guys, any church that's going to be the church has to understand that not only are we called to take the gospel to the world, but we're called to clothe the cold. We're called to feed the hungry. We're called to uplift the downtrodden. We're called to set at liberty those that are captive. And we're called to bring healing to those that are bruised. That's the scripture. And so, yes, tell your story. Yes, be spiritual saints serving the Savior, but understand it goes beyond just the preaching of the gospel to the ministry to the lives of people wherever they are. So they anointed with oil. They just took them. They had their, their bottle of oil with them. Wherever they went, they just did a little anointing. And it says, and they healed us. They did the best they could with what they had. Not the close. The disciples returned from the missionary journey, as we see, testifying to the great things that had been accomplished through the name of Jesus. Here's what you get. They were faithful to God, and God was faithful to them. We have been called. We have been commissioned as ambassadors in the service of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And one day we will give an account, just like they did, of our ministry. I pray as part of that report, we can testify to the lives of the change and the souls of the child as we represented well our Savior. I mean, I, of course I wasn't there. The Bible doesn't expand on it, but they got into their holy huddle after they came back from their journey. And Jesus said, well, boys, how did you get them? Don't you see it? They 
Master, can I tell you about that young man that was bound up by Satan and by the power of his name he was delivered? Jesus responds, well, that, that's, that's really good. Do you know why that happened? Well, it's the power of your name. No, it's because you carry the power of my name. And you shared it. Another disciple says, well, Lord, I, I didn't see anybody saved, but I, I ran across someone that was hungry and I fed them. And Jesus said, well, well done. That's good. Right. That's a part of it. Got to have both. Lord, I mean, my, my story's not like that one, and my story's not like that one, but, 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 I, but I ran across a man whose life was just in shattered pieces. He lost his job, he lost his home, he lost his family, and I was able to encourage him. And when I left there, Lord, he was, he was feeling good about life again. But uh, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the ministry of the church is all about preaching the gospel. But it goes beyond that. For those who are saved, this message serves as a reminder of the call. A call of faith in God. His power and his provision. A call of faithfulness. To be faithful in the church and fruitful outside the church. Knowing that one day you will stand before God and give an account of your life. And his ministry. And as I am fond of saying, and oh, by the way, if that day were today, what would your report be? How would you describe last week? How would you describe last month? How would you describe last year? And would the Lord say, well done. For those, and I know that there are, who are not saved, the message this morning, the story this morning, serves as a reminder of the awful consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ and rejecting the invitation of God to you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the Old Testament, there seems to be no more horrifying event that God pouring out fire upon the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. But Jesus said, for those who reject me, it'll be worse. And the only way I can figure that out, once again, is they died by fire. Life was over. Those who reject Jesus Christ die and eternity begins in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone from which there is no rescue. Father, in Jesus' name, speak through your words. Speak to our hearts. Challenge us, Lord, to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful followers, fulfilling the commands, the will, the desire of our Master. And knowing, Lord, that we can do that not in our own strength. For though you call, you are able. Father, as believers in Christ, help us be committed this day. Even as Luke records the words of Jesus, if any man would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. Father, I pray today for those who are here this morning without Jesus. Lord, it's a sad thing to be here today without Jesus. It's a worse thing to leave here today without because you're inviting many women, boys and girls to come this morning and to put their faith in you and receive your son Jesus and receive from him the gift of eternal life. So Lord, I pray when the invitation in a moment begins, they'll not see it as an invitation from me, but an invitation from you and they'll respond to you. And I pray they're going to respond in a positive fashion, stepping out, walking down this aisle, Say, pastor or counselor, I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior.